Thanks. Take her down to periscope depth. Yes, sir. Clear the bridge. Dive. <laughs> I'm Salvador Cordova. Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons video channel. And today we're going to be talking uh, about the concept of expected value. And I'm joined here by my co-host, uh, Pigs Can Fly. So uh, thanks for joining us. And we're going to try to work through this together. So I'm first going to share my screen uh, just to test out some See if I could do some power steering here. So let me try this X I and let's see if I can render it. Will it render? Is it gonna? It's supposed to be able to. Oh, it's not gonna do that to me, is it? Uh, I like how it has all the other symbols there. <laughs> it doesn't give you the ability to do X of I. Oh, it used to render it. Uh, What's it's, it's it used latex. to render it on the uh, screen. Code. And here, I'm going to try to pull that up myself. I'm sorry. I'm going to try to pull up that program real quick, um, so I can get a good idea of what you're dealing with. Yeah, it's uh, latex, latex code cogs. Code I used to be com. able to do this without having to download it. So now it's being kind of. Uh, Yeah, it's just now pulling up uh, here on my side. Okay. And oh, there it is. Xi. Okay. There Xi you go. equals. All right. Let's say X of heads. Let's try this. Okay. X heads. Okay, x heads equals 100%. Maybe it doesn't like that. Maybe it likes, but it definitely didn't like that. I don't know why it didn't. It did like 1%. It. 
it did the one percent, but it didn't show up. Whatever. So let's yeah, try strange. this. I think it needs. It likes. It really likes brackets. Yeah. No. Possibly that could be the issue. Uh, you would think. It well, would... it didn't need the um, the brackets for the one percent. So I think it's probably that maybe it doesn't desire one hundred percent. Let's see, one percent. <clears throat> so the it's it's just kind of funny. Mm -hmm. It likes ten percent. It just blows. It gets ten percent. Okay, now oh, it likes one percent. <laughs> You're seeing the rendering here. Oh, no, I do. Yeah. One one hundred percent. And then if I say X tails equals zero, right? Zero percent. I don't know why it didn't like that. Or do you have to be like right next to it, um, like on your cursor for it? Or okay, so oh, it has to be next to each other. So it should let me do it on separate lines. I've never had problems with it on separate lines. Yeah, it's still there from what uh, I can see. I think it was just the initial um, condition because it was right after and you had already pressed enter. So it was a little bit further down, but it looks fine now. Um, well, it's, it, it's concatenating it, which I didn't want it to do. So this is... So it's adding them together where you didn't want it to be? Yeah, I didn't want it to do it that way. Okay. So let me uh, see now I lost my I lost my equation editor. I don't know what happened. Okay. It didn't used to be that way. Let's see, latex. So it used to be code cogs was the best one, but now it's it's kind of not, not as good as it used to be. So let me try this one. Oh, look. I mean, okay, so yeah, I was going to say, that's not the same algorithm, right? It's not. So. Okay. And I'm afraid they're going to put these. Uh, I can't really let's see if I can get rid of that. Okay. So this is latex for techniques. Okay, so that's. I can almost do this from let's see x i. X. Heads equal 100%. And I don't know why it's not populating on the side. Oh, I'll, I'll do compile. All right, so let's let's just start with this. Let me just compile. Okay, yeah, it's on the right side. The math jacks likes it. Uh, this is a little bit obnoxious here that it's um, Well, it's rendering it down here on the lower right. So X adds equals 100%. Now let's do a compile. All right, it likes it. Yeah, equals 100. And okay. I think what it wants is to have a... Uh, Does the percent have to be in front? It has to be a literal. There's a literal oh, okay. percent. Uh, I forgot how to do a literal. Um, let me look that up. Latex percent. Sorry, I'm completely ignorant on this. <laughs> and it wants a slash backslash percent. A backslash. Okay. That's what it wants. Okay, so I'm I'm learning how to to type this because I can have cleaner, I can have cleaner looking. Yeah, see, that's what I wanted. X okay, adds equals one hundred percent, and then I'm going to say X 
tails equals zero. It's a backslash per second. Yep. And then gotcha. see now we're now we're starting to 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 get where I wanted P P heads is equal to 0.5 and P tails equals now I'm going to compile it oh and it would okay it's, I need to get a carriage return here. See if it's going to let me do a carriage return. Uh, okay, let me see. Latex. I think it's line. doing it successively. So it's slash. Let, let me try to do this. I think it likes this. Let's see if it will do that. Okay. Yeah. So just two backslash. Yep. Gotcha. Oh, so you're, I can tell, <laughs> this is going to be fun because you're, you seem comfortable with computer languages already. This is great. Yeah, I did a little bit of studies on like coding and things like that, but um, I'm not like super great at it or anything like that. <laughs> Can't okay, hack so anybody's computer yeah. or anything like that. So we have the math jacks here. I, I'm going to just close this latex mm -hmm. window because it just keeps giving me compile errors. And I'm just going to expand here. Oh, this is great. See, I can do math. See, once I learn the hang of it, so the equation we had to deal with, uh, it's expected value. We wanted to, th this, by the way, this is, you've helped me more than I've helped you, I'm afraid, because I really wanted to learn how to do, um, be able to type math. Okay, so we're actually just going to go through the symbols here. Xi means mm -hmm. going through basically all of the the values of X. Yeah, like what it. And, and so all the, the values of X of are that? like X. I'm sorry. What would be the physical property of that? Like if we were looking at something in reality. Uh, you'll see it. So kind of one of the unfortunate things is you actually have to try to do this in the total abstract in the math sense. And then it starts to get a physical interpretation. <laughs> and then okay. sometimes it gets into pure, pure the theoretical stuff, which is also nice too. But the idea is, <clears throat> maybe I should have used a, I'm going to amend the symbols a little bit here. I'm going to use a lowercase x. And I'm going to recompile it. And let's look at the symbols again. So let me, uh, when, when we have like um, an iterator here, like I, j just think all yeah. the discrete states that a, that a, um, an object can take. Coins are really easy. There are only two things, heads and tails. <laughs> That's why it's really nice. So I will, uh, we could say I equals heads and tails. So maybe I'll make that more explicit mm -hmm. where equals heads, comma, tails. Let's recompile that. Okay. So just... All right, so I takes on values of, it only takes on, we could say zero and one, but that's just going to make it more confusing. I'll just say yeah. I equals heads or tails. So we're going to iterate through, once you can get through two of them, then you can get through any number. And then uh, let me modify the, uh, let's see, X is, let me make sure I get the, the notation here. What's going to be a little frustrating is everyone will render this a little different. Xi. I don't like this notation. This is terrible. 
I can I can see it already. F of x i. Right, everyone's using different notations. That this is going to be annoying. Uh, this is going to be totally backward from the way it's stated here, because I really don't like this okay. notation. Let me look at another one. So this is, like I said, this is a learning session for me. That's why I like teaching, because it's a great chance to yeah. also learn. <laughs> no worries on learning, definitely. Uh, and this is where it's going to be aggravating, because Okay, so, so the way they have it in Wikipedia is what I was thinking. You have X, I, P, I, and uh, so X, I, we can actually, I think, see if they actually have this. No, they don't have it as a function. All right. So let's go with the Wikipedia uh, definition of expected value. So I just, I just totally clunked through this. And it's kind of like what I don't, it's a little frustrating in math. Everyone defines their symbols differently. Let me see if they had the word right. Pascal. Okay, so <clears throat> just as F history, the idea of expected value originated in the middle of the 17th century from the study, study of the so-called problem of points, which seeks to divide the stakes in a fair way between two players who have to end their game before it is properly finished. This problem has been debated for centuries and many conflicting proposals and solutions had been suggested over the years. When it was posed, by, posed, to, uh, posed to Blaise Pascal by French writer and amateur mathematician Chevalier de Mer in 1654, Mer claimed that this problem couldn't be solved and, it, and that it just showed how flawed mathematics was when it came to its application to the real world. Pascal, being a mathematician, was provoked and determined to solve the problem once and for all. He began to discuss the problem in a now famous series of letters with Pierre de Fermat. Soon enough, they both independently came up with a solution. They solved the problem in different computational ways, but the results were identical because their computations were based on the same fundamental principle. The principle is that the value of a future gain should be directly proportional to the chance of getting it. This principle seemed to have come naturally to both of them. They were very pleased by the fact that they had found essentially the same solution, and this in turn made them absolutely convinced that they had solved the problem conclusively. However, they did not publish their findings. They only informed a small circle of mutual friends in Paris about it. Mm -hmm. uh, three years later, in 1657, a Dutch mathematician, Christian Huygens, who had just visited Paris, published a treatise, De Rachocinis in Ludo Alle, uh, on probability. In his book, he considered the problem of points and presented a solution based on the same principles as the solutions of Pascal and Fermat. Huygens extends the concept of expectation by adding rules for how to calculate expectations in more complicated situations than the original problem, uh, e.g. for three or more players. In this sense, this book can, can be seen as the first successful attempt at laying down the foundations of the theory of probability. So, <clears throat> And it says here, neither Pascal nor Huygens used the term expectation in the modern sense. So um, interested people can look at this, but uh, it, the idea of expected value comes from those mathematicians, Pascal, Fermat, and Huygens. And, and this does relate to Pascal's wager, but um, I was just taking a break there just to kind of... Um, no, that's good. Yeah, just see the context. I mean, if you could... This took centuries to solve, uh, and, and that's why we have all these formalisms. So anyway, I'm using now... We're going to do this summation here, X, I, P, I, and we're just going to calculate E of X. 
and, and so I'm just going to execute it here. So e of x equals No, let me see. I, I'm going to try to do this in paint. With x of i. Sum of x i p i. There's a way to do this. Let's see. Uh, I think is it sum? If you're going to do sum, I think you have to put parentheses or um, yeah, brackets. X i p i. Is it pi, xi? I may not even need the parentheses. But let's just see how this renders. Maybe it's going to blow up. Mm -hmm. Oop, I need to do this. Let's recompile. Pretty close. Yeah, that's what I want. I mean, there's there's a way I could add limits. I'm not going to put the limits for, for now. I mean, um, okay. there's a way to do this so it looks a little... Well, while we're here, and this is learn and learning experience, I'm trying to make this look like this. Let me see if I can. Right. Uh, let me see. I'm going to try this one more time. Um, Sum i equals one to k. Okay, let me try this. Sum, okay, so some latex editors won't take this. Uh, i to let's let's try it. There. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. But here it says i equals one, so okay. that's just the assumed value. Yeah, right? we, can, we can. We can. We can. I can do that. I equal. Well, it's better if I just leave it i because I don't. <laughs> I don't. It's yeah, not really. Yeah, because it's going to be an assumed value, I think. Yeah, we, we can okay. do i to k, or i to n. What 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 did they use? Let me see. Uh, okay, we'll just go to to. You know what? I don't like that I to K symbol. So <laughs> I'm just going to remove it. I mean, the thing is, is people that work with this will figure out what the symbols mean. And that's what can be a little frustrating is that everyone will kind of represent the same idea a little different and the notation can just throw you, throw you off. I had that experience recently. So let's, let's right. just try to calculate this i to k and so that equals and I'm just going to do this really explicitly x heads x heads times p heads plus x tails times p tails let's compile it p oh let me uh, fix that i like this editor i actually do this is nice <laughs> x heads p heads x tails p tails and then now let's put some numbers to it that equals x heads is 100 percent times 0.5 plus zero percent times 0.5 and that equals 50%. So if we did this right, after all that, oh, and let me put a, 
I need to put a correct correction symbol here. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of formality to get the expected value of 50%. <laughs> but you could see that one could, um, one could extend the idea to, to any number of situations. And, and, and so we spent probably 30, 45 minutes just going through the formalities and also seeing the different ways that they mm -hmm. express expected value. But this can be done, um, it can be expanded and generalized to all sorts of things. But if you can do it for a, a simple case like this, you, one can actually see kind of the notion of expected value. So obviously, if you just have one coin and you flip it, it's not going to be 50% heads or zero. Uh, it's not going to be 50% heads. It's either going to be heads or tails if you just right, have 100%. one coin. But now if you have a system of a million coins or if you flip the coin uh, a million times and just record the results, uh, you should get approximately 50%. And right. Uh, <clears throat> there is, I believe, the strong, uh, the strong law of large numbers. If you go out to fin infinity, it will be fifty percent. Uh, mm -hmm. If you could <laughs> hypothetically flip it an um, uh, infinite number of times, I think that's what the strong law of large numbers is. And um, so, like, if you have just say. Two coins, if you only do like say two flips, you're not going to, you may not end up with 50%. If you do one flip, you definitely won't end up with 50% because it's either going to be zero right. or one, 100%. If you have two coins, it won't be 50%. But the more, the, the more flips you have, the number of heads and tails will, will continue to approach 50%. And that's all it means. The law of large numbers mm -hmm. means we're going to approach, um, the average will will approach the expected value, and so the expected value is fifty percent, and the average will approach it. And that it, it's as simple as that. But you could see that um, the formalities are kind of heavy-handed. Uh, one doesn't necessarily have to do this for like just a coin flip, but if we have more complicated scenarios. Uh, then you need the machinery of that formality to be able to process it all. Uh, definitely, if one right. is analyzing casino games, uh, you'll need all these formalities to, to, to help the, with the accounting. So that was kind of agonizing to, 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 to be able to do that. But you said you did well when you took yeah, that. So this, this, you know, I think this exercise just helped me to to get more familiar with LaTeX. So the, I'm going to save this LaTeX for techniques.com. And uh, now we know how to. Um, you could do like a. Um, convert the symbols. Hang on. I'm going to do a snipping tool. If, if you wanted to try to type something cool. yourself and, and try to communicate it to me, that'd be fine too. So the reason I... So I if you can't see this on the computer, I can uh, send you like you know, the snapshot of what was saved. Okay. So that you have it for your records. So surprisingly, this is kind of important to analyzing aspects of the origin of life. Uh, there are some chemical outcomes that can be described in terms of the law of large numbers or violations thereof. The violations being uh, what creationists and ID proponents would say is is a is a indicator of intelligent design. Right. And, um, a very simple example is if we have homo linkage that uh, let's say five hundred. Uh, DNA bonds to, to be properly homolinked, uh, even 500 of them would be uh, astronomically remote based on the law of large numbers. And we can actually justify that in terms of uh, chemistry. I mean, Change Tan spent a lot of time, because she's a physical organic chemist, and she's saying uh, in a random prebiotic soup, this is 
these reactions just don't happen naturally. It's the opposite. It is exactly. well modeled by coin flips because there's no way to control it. You need, you need all the machinery of the cell to regulate it. When we try to build these DNAs from pure scratch, like if I took Craig Ventner's files on a computer and said, okay, this is the representation. Now build it in a chemical environment. We have to have these robotic machines do it and it does it painfully slow. Um, exactly. Because they have to orient things and I can illustrate that. So um, did you want me to show your, uh, what you did on, on my screen or um, if you said, no, it was just do you have it for references in case we need to use it for future use for some reason that way you, you don't have to go through like, Oh. I mean, you don't have to retype it, but it'll be much easier to pick it out, you know, just for your future references. Because um, I do that that all the time when I'm working. Like, I, I have something I pull. I'm like, I need this for later, so I'll hold on to it. Oh, great. So let me let me do it and try to do this. In yeah, I just sent you the. Um, oh, it it gave me an error. I was trying to export it, and it it uh, completely. Oh, no worries. Yeah, you already have it in your email. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. But I just took a snipping tool, pulled out that segment, and then we, we already have it saved there. It's good to go. I'm still typing it out, though, just for my references. So I don't forget the algorithm. But um, Yeah. So, you know, this is what's, what I feel that uh, this is time well spent. You see, we spent an hour, but now we feel comfort. Both you and I feel more comfortable with um mm -hmm. with the concept i feel more comfortable trying to teach it and then explain what it means because it's really frustrating when i say expected value and <laughs> people just shake their head i'm just like you know it would help if you all just had two hours of this instead of spending it on a these shouting matches in the open mic <laughs> <laughs> just like okay, i know you guys some of you guys spend hours listening to open mic shouting matches Spend a spend an hour and you'll learn the term expected value. Um, mm -hmm. You know we don't have to get into the really complex ones. Being able to do heads and tails is very adequate. Now, what happens in change Tan's case? It's actually instead of heads and tails, you have maybe you have thousands of states possible uh, or hundreds of combinations uh, that can happen. And, 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 and so this, uh, it becomes just insane to, uh, maybe it would be a good exercise if I actually tried to, to do this with her chemical diagrams and say, okay, let's just make the numbers a little easier. And this will be actually very generous to make it this way because it's a lot worse if we actually use the actual numbers. And it would still be, it would be astronomical. Yeah, within, I can imagine. It'd be astronomical within about 20 nucleotides um, because the chemicals are so <laughs> fragile. Um, maybe yeah, I've heard to explain this same problem um, to several atheists, actually. Uh, I mean, I actually understood this portion of like abiogenesis like years ago. Even when I was an agnostic, I understood that there were some serious problems there. And I mean, just, yeah, just based on like the probabilities of like a coin flip. I mean, you're talking crazy numbers here just to just to start not even not even getting to the actual numbers you would need right <clears throat> and um that's why I, ca I, I mean whenever it came down to it like i think intelligent design is not only the best explanation it's really just the only one <laughs> it's not like a yeah i i just whenever i look at it and i see those numbers i'm just sitting there thinking to myself okay that's impossible there's there's literally no other way there has to be a designer right that would put those sorts of things into motion. Otherwise, it wouldn't happen, period. Right. And, um, even, and, even, um, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to oh. say that I have seen um, scientists even claim that numbers that, that go that go beyond like time, uh, one times 10 to the you know, 40th, I think it was, or no, I'm sorry, it was 60, 60 150th. That's like beyond impossible. <laughs> like it, it, it's like it's something that would just not happen in nature, period. Well, it actually, and, um, this analysis, th this analysis explains why life doesn't spontaneously arise. It's consistent, actually, right. with experiment and observation. And and the abiogenesis advocates uh, have to that. have to invoke imaginary scenarios that they can't possibly prove. 
and, and they have to cherry pick the mm -hmm. data. So this was the diagram showing what Change Tan was analyzing. And she was analyzing all the various yeah. combinations. I mean, this is, okay, a, phys a physical organic chemist would understand these diagrams. I, I kind of like halfway do, but um, it, it, uh, she was pointing out, uh, we just have two uh, different nucleobases and I'm embarrassed. I think yeah. one's cytosine, the one's adenine. I should know which one is which. Okay, adenine and then the <laughs> cytosine. Okay, so this is adenine here and this is cytosine and she's showing all the ways that they could be combined. She estimated there's on the order just with just two. Okay, so this is not, this is more sophisticated than the coin flick. This is how we can put yeah. all the parts together and there's 16,000 different ways to do it. So instead of a coin that has yeah. heads or tails, you have something with 16,000 different states. And, and the, I, odds, the odds of that should be comparable to the number of interactions you actually have first. So you already have 16,000 possible interactions. That's not even counting the actual interactions you're required to have just to make the certain you know, chemical compound, right? Exactly, exactly. So, exactly. <laughs> so if you throw this in a soup, the odds that it will... Okay, what she was basically saying is it's really nice when you can just build it like this, which the cell does. But mm -hmm. if we just threw it in a random soup, it's just going to be a mess. And I tried to illustrate the problem with... There are various ways to illustrate the problem, but I tried to illustrate it with Scrabble letters. Okay. And let me, let me illustrate yeah, it. So, I think you just passed it a moment ago. Okay, so that here are the Scrabble okay. letters. If we just threw them there, you couldn't read them. Right. And so I'm just going to spell the word ledger. But let's say we had them all in sort of disoriented connections. Different. Right. It's right. not readable. What, to make it readable, it's it has funny because a lot of atheists will, well, whenever I talk to atheists, they'll usually say, um, well, you can't compare this to a code, right? So you can't start using words as like a comparison. <clears throat> Correct. And I, I always say that's not what the modern scientists say. <laughs> like the modern well, day scientists are saying it's actually code. So. What I'll say is I won't even go there. I don't go into the code argument. You'll notice I avoid it, even though I, I agree with it. What you can do, however, mm -hmm. is that independent of meaning, for this to be read by a machine, for example, it has to be arranged in a way that is lined up. Because you could see there's so many ways we could make this not even readable. You have to orient right. the Scrabble letter so that it's readable. And I'm just, I'm going to do that right mm -hmm. now. And what is this analogous to? This is analogous to Different interactions. the chemical, uh, where was it here? The DNAs being able to be aligned so that they're in readable format because then you can have one machine that's going to go through here and read it or replicate it or whatever because if it's not in a if it's not in this nice little railway here you see how it has kind of like mm -hmm. this phosphate group kind of out here and it's nice and uniform this makes this DNA strand readable if, if we didn't have that and it has to be like that uh, yeah, that's why uh, a genome wouldn't be readable if you just had it, uh, basically, if it were, if a genome were all, if you had all the nucleotides just kind of scrambled like that, which is what it would be in a prebiotic soup, it's not readable. That's not, exactly. we're, we're not even talking about code well, here. We we're just talking about making that's not, something readable. And see, that's not even the only issue, if you really think about it, because um, when it, okay, so just even assuming that there would be interactions like this chemically anywhere, right? We're talking about in within like nanometers or I mean mic microns, basically, right? In the extremely small space. You have to be within that small space to have the interaction in the first place, right? So, I mean. <laughs> You think that this stuff is like moving around? What's happening here? No, it's going to be sitting there. And then maybe something might get nudged towards it, possibly, accidentally. I don't know. But still, I mean, the odds of that happening are just insanely low. <laughs> well, and, and the reason we know that is uh, we, we've tried to build DNA from scratch. 
and we've had to borrow mm-hmm. cellular machinery to help us for one. And then when we try to do it, even then when we try to build some things from scratch, uh, uh, she goes into this in her book and she describes the experimental, um, the, 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 all the robots that are needed, that they mix the chemicals and then they, you know, they quote unquote exactly. freeze the process, change all the chemicals, put another set in, and mm-hmm. then you add, that's how you add one nucleotide at a time and it's very painful and slow. And she was just saying, right. yeah, in life it does it like millions of times faster. It is slow. Our robots are so slow and inefficient by comparison. And um, yeah. So this was the point of the, um, let me see if I could bring this down now. This was the point of the law of large numbers. So let's go back to this. Yeah. So this is why this concept is important because it's not that we have to analyze all aspects of life. This is just the first round. I mean, we haven't even dealt with um, making proteins or functional proteins, and then transmembrane proteins that are part of in the lipid bilayer. <laughs> right. Uh, like There's so much. So, I mean, the lipids alone is 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 to me mind boggling. I mean, what I think uh, Dr. James Tour talked about it. He said there's over forty thousand individual lipids. So we're not even talking about like just one type. We're talking about forty thousand. That's that's required to be right. there. And they're all different. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the origin of life researchers are trying to simplify things and they're giving misleading. I, I'm tempted to say dishonest, but dishonest is when you know that what you're saying is untrue. I think these guys are just deluded in that, you know, uh, someone yeah. can be mistaken because they're just flat deluded. They're believing their own falsehoods. And at least then, you know, right. the conscience is clear and they can say, well, I, I believe it, you know, and I'm just like, well, everything right. that we know about chemistry do- doesn't agree with that. But if you want to delude yourself, go ahead, <laughs> but don't delude other people is exactly. what I'm complaining about. So this, this is why the importance right. of expected value. Now I can, I can, I can extend this idea to casino games if you like. Um, if, for example, uh, we made X heads equal to, I'm just going to pick a number. Um, uh, one X heads equals, let me see. Yeah, we could actually use the same symbols. So let me let me change that from a let me change the 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 pounds the percent symbols into dollars. See if I could do that. Dollars, okay. Not that we would. Well, actually, there is a casino. Um, there's a casino. What they call a free bet. So this does actually have some relevance both to Pascal's wager and how to beat the casinos. <laughs> and, 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 and people have beaten the casinos with this. Uh, it, it's called a, um, it's when the casinos have created a marketing weakness. So, so, so basically instead of percentages, let, let me uh, correct this. So that's, I'm just going to put in uh, dollars instead of the percentages. Now we're corrupting people here because we're teaching them how to gamble. Well, <laughs> we call it invest. Uh, okay. So we can we can just change it, and you're like, that's kind of funny. And, and basically the casino, uh, they call it a marketing campaign where they try to attract pa- patrons. Like let's say <clears throat> they'll give a promotion. They'll say, oh, you can come to the casino. We'll give you a free bet and you could stay here. Uh, just pay the hotel mm-hmm. like 50 bucks and we'll give you a free bet. Or pay, pay the hotel. Like if you go to the hotel, like they have these travel packages. So someone just wants to go to Las Vegas yeah. for fun. And in the travel package, they'll say, hey, you know, we'll give you a coupon 
and it's a free bet. If you lose, uh, you don't lose any money, but if you win uh, on the coupon, we'll, we'll, we'll pay you a hundred dollars. They call that, yeah, right. they call that a uh, free bet. And I've actually, some people are really smart and they've analyzed it and they said, Oh, you know, I have this, if I purchase this coupon book in the, or, or they'll find a way to maybe sometimes through dishonest means to get multiple coupon books. Like uh, there's a time <laughs> someone actually just went, uh, th this is, I mean, it's rare, but he, he, he found all these free coupon books that were just at the airport as kind of a marketing ploy. And, mm -hmm. and, and granted they weren't, um, I mean the sum total maybe of the coupons is maybe $1, but he found thousands of these. So he just was playing all mm -hmm. these free bets in the casino just all day long. I mean, that's not, I mean, that's very time consuming, but he was able to convert all his coupons and made a thousand dollars. And, and, and so, the way that people have very successfully beat the casinos is when they analyze their marketing promotions and the cost of getting the coupons. They, they weigh it out. And one guy beat Atlantic Casino, uh, Atlantic City Casinos for $4 million because he knew how to game the oh system. Wow. So what he did, he was also a really good con artist. He, he posed himself as like a total degenerate loser gambler. And so the casino said, okay, mm -hmm. this guy has a lot of money. He doesn't know what he's doing. And uh, we'll also give him what they call a loss rebate. And, and it could be in the form of these coupons. And so he just played the, the you know, the, uh, he acted out the role of just uh, being a, a total degenerate drunk. And he wasn't, <laughs> but he was a very good actor. And so he would be mm -hmm. just like anyone else losing, but they say, Hey, we'll give you 20% rebate on all your, when you get a really bad loss. And so they'd be giving him these mm -hmm. coupons or, or whatever, or the equivalent of them. And, and he, he realized, Oh my goodness, you know, just that little bit of extra could help me um, using the law of large numbers. If I just play the game long enough, I'm going to, I'm going to extract millions of dollars in the casino. And he did. <laughs> He didn't cheat. <laughs> he just realized the, the casino managers were just foolish. And uh, just for the sake of the... They would bet against him. <laughs> let, let me, just for completeness, let me see. Don Johnson. Here it is. Here's the story. And it's, in of all things, the magazine, The Atlantic. Oh, here it is. The man who broke Atlantic City, Don Johnson, won nearly $6 million playing blackjack in one night, single-handedly decimating wow. the monthly revenue of Atlantic City's Tropicana Casino. Not long before that, he'd taken Borgata <laughs> for $5 million, Caesars for $4 million. Here's how he did it. And wow. I laid out the basic math here, is what you do if you want to beat the casinos, uh, find out when they do something stupid, and just give you the equivalent of free bets. Because if you flip heads and you get $100 and you flip tails, you get zero. You don't get any penalty. You take that bet. Right. And there's just the, you know, there are variations <laughs> on this. And that's essentially what he was doing. Of course, you have to be really clever to be able to bamboozle the casino so that they would give you such generous terms. But what he was doing is he, he's saying, oh, you know, Brigada gave me these terms. Uh, I'll play here if you give me better terms. And of course they would give him these better right. terms. And then he would go back to the other casino. He said, you know, I'm going to play um, <laughs> at that casino now because they give me these terms. And so they, he got the casinos to keep competing at each, uh, against each other. And uh, when mm -hmm. he was in position, all he had to do is just finally cash in. So he, he killed Atlantic city, <laughs> just wiped them out. <laughs> uh, I mean, he was a genius. I mean, so, so the math was actually pretty simple, but it's the con artistry that, made him successful I, I i couldn't have done what he did yeah um i got kicked out of the casinos for a mere thirty thousand. but i mean this guy was just cleaning him out i wasn't a good beer i wasn't a, i looked like a scholar i <laughs> they had a beat on me they said this like, guy doesn't uh, look a, like a gambler <laughs> okay they, they took one look at me he said yeah that's a scholar he looks like a he looks like a university student <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, um, 
I hope that was helpful. Did you have any other questions? And um, we can have another session like you know, this. I, put, I put the whole algorithm over here in one of my sticky notes, and then uh, I was just kind of typing that out while you were talking about what was going on. And no, I really appreciate that. That's pretty awesome that they all <laughs> managed to do all that. Yeah. And you said you, did, you said you won thirty thousand. Yeah, I won thirty thousand over an extended period of time. Uh, and, and, and in small casinos, small amounts at a time. Uh, I didn't like wagering oh, lots, okay. but they still, they began to track. Right. Yeah, they, they began to see it. They said my betting patterns were correlated with the, with the uh, favorable odds. Uh, it's, it's very simple, the idea of card yeah. counting. Um, yeah. If, for example, you, uh, the dealer, just let's just take a single deck game, and he's dealt out half the cards, and you haven't seen any aces dealt out, that means by way of inference, the rest of the deck has, is rich with aces. And you could do that for like the, what they right. call the face cards. So if you're able to estimate that the deck is rich in aces and face cards, you have, um, you have a statistical edge over the casino and you just play that. And, and so that's what a card counter, all, all that he does. And he has to find favorable games to that effect. Uh, and that's how the that's mm -hmm. how the card game is beaten, but some of like the best uh, the best attacks on the casino has has been when the casino has made mistakes, and a sharp mathematician with at least some moderate ability has seen that oh they they've had a failure in their marketing promotions. So um, I gave an example with the here where there's this this is like this is actually Pascal's wager. You have nothing to lose by playing the game, every, you know, something to gain. Exactly. And that's, uh, when you can find these situations uh, and the, um, the marketing department has made a slight vulnerability, it can be exploited and you can take the casinos for millions. So what'll happen sometimes is these teams of advantage players that will just, you know, there has to be some level of trust that they're gonna handle the money correctly. They'll just go into the casinos and they might have a million dollars and then start wagering it, but it's really cover for exploiting all of the marketing uh, coupons and then they'll come away making a million dollars. But uh, there has to be trust in those teams to be able to do this. And there are other, there are other perks. You can be put up in thousand dollar a night hotels and, and just like for free. So that's also kind of nice. Um, so the irony though is the people that are good at this really don't get caught up in the lifestyle. Uh, because if they did, mm -hmm. um, their discipline would break down and they'd actually be very bad gamblers. So that's kind of the irony. The, the, the people that don't like that, that lifestyle actually do the best. And so that's why, oddly enough, one of the best teams of casino sharks were Christians. And that was the movie The Holy Rollers. <laughs> did you ever the see Holy that? Rollers. Yeah, I remember you telling me about that. Okay, let me Yeah, I watched a good you. portion of it and I checked that portion at the end that you were talking about. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So that, that was, um, yeah, that, that was a part of my life. I, I you know, I, I, uh, my father had passed away and I was just, just lost. It, it kind of just being able to just go to the casinos and not, you know, just to count cards. It, 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 it's kind of just like jogging or something. It just kind of got my mind off of the pain and, um, it yeah. kind of was an escape and a chance to use my math skills. And that, other than that, I really didn't like the casino environment at all. Just all the gambling, drinking, and smoking just really turned me off. <laughs> Same. I don't really drink or anything like that. Even when I was in the Navy, I didn't drink. And I'd like to thank everyone here who joined us for our talk. And again, I'd like to thank uh, Pigs Can Fly as, uh, uh, for his for his service in the United States Navy on onboard submarines and um, he did mention that uh, uh, he got to see some seals uh, on his submarine and I was sharing with uh, pigs can fly that uh, on my channel I had the privilege of interviewing a platoon commander uh, S Sandy Pigeon and and Sandy gave his testimony of how he became a Christian. So I would invite people uh, that want to hear Sandy's testimony to go to uh, the channel and there's featured past shows and there you could see Sandy's testimony there. And, and so, uh,
pigs can fly. I look forward. If we you want to talk again, we can on on math and origin Absolutely. of life or uh, technical matters like this. Uh, this also gives me an opportunity to announce to the viewers I'm having a daughter channel, so to speak, uh, called the Evidence Reasons Academy, where we can actually do more of this pure math stuff and just pure science, uh, because this can get uh, we can get very bogged down in just teaching many classes on just basic science and math, physics, and chemistry. That's very important, and I don't want it to. Um, I don't want it to get. Uh, uh, I, I want to segregate it away from the evidence and reasons main channel, which is a little bit more for popular consumption, and even then, that's really nerdy. But the the uh, evidence and reasons academy, uh, it's going to be the norm that we have just almost pure academics there. And some Christian theology and, and encouragement, but uh, we'll segregate that out. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and wish everyone a happy new year. Take care and God bless you all.